Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another um, weekly EHS Coffee and Compliance webinar. Um, today, we will be chatting with Samir about COVID impact on environmental compliance after one year. And for those of you who don't know, Coffee and Compliance is our weekly webinar that talks to leaders and regulators about emerging issues, career development, case studies, and so much more. So thank you for joining us today. And before we jump into everything, I wanted to take a second to introduce ourselves. So my name is Celine. I'm a customer success manager here at Mapa Street. And my name is Jillian, and I'm the compliance solutions manager. And the two of us work within the customer experience team here at Mapa Street. And for those of you who are new to Mapa Street, we do like to introduce ourselves <laughs> as a company. So we are an environmental compliance platform on the software side. For industrial facilities, we focus on providing transparency, promoting collaboration, ensuring efficiency, and finally creating accountability. Yes, we are a data-driven platform that helps companies monitor, analyze, and track all of their compliance needs in one location on our software. And with that, we are very excited to welcome Samir. Um, Samir joined us last um, April um, on coffee and compliance to talk about the COVID pandemic. And now he's returning a year later or almost a year later um, to talk about how COVID has impacted environmental compliance in this past year. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank welcome back. To be here. Thanks. <laughs> That's good to be back. I mean, it's it's been a year, really. It's yeah. somehow it, the time flew by and it took seemingly forever. Yeah, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so we have made it one year round and we're really excited to have you. Uh, it's, it's unique, you know, to have somebody a year later from something as like this. <laughs> so yes, welcome back and we'll go ahead and jump to a few questions and get started. So first question, we just like to ask our speakers if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your background as far as your career path and your current role today. Sure, thanks. Um, well, so I came to the practice of environmental law um, after trying a few different career paths out. Um, I started off uh, after graduating college. Um, I spent some time teaching in uh, the public school system in, in Houston, Texas, actually um, not teaching environmental science or anything like that, teaching English and history for several years, oh, and, then, um, and then made a pivot, uh, actually thinking that I was going to become a marine biologist, which you it, it, it always amazes me when I tell people that so many people say, I wanted to become a marine biologist. I don't know if <laughs> there's something inside, inside people naturally that draws us to that. Um, so I played around with that for a couple of years, and it was actually through that experience that I settled on um, pursuing a career path in environmental law. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been practicing in that uh, field for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, now as a partner at, at Hanson Bridget's Environment, Natural Resources, and Land Use Group, uh, my practice focuses mo mainly on litigation, environmental litigation, um, as well as compliance counseling and enforcement defense. Okay, cool. And um, how did you get into your practice with that like specific, <laughs> I don't know, specific branch, I suppose? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I knew when I went to law school that I wanted to practice in environmental law, um, but uh, my experience in law school I found was very geared toward um, kind of preparing people to be litigators, and uh, that you know that worked well for me, that suited my style. And so my first experience out of school was really doing general litigation, commercial and business litigation, um, and. Uh, understanding how to how to work matters that way um, and I just kind of kept that going when I went after my first position with an environmental firm um, doing environmental work just sort of taking what I knew as a litigator and and adding the layer of um, the environmental law on top of that and then I think from that from that experience working um, in environmental law on the litigation end clients started having questions about compliance they would be facing um, enforcement actions and they'd need help with those. And, and that's sort of how that practice developed. I see. Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool and definitely an interesting way to come about your career. So thanks for sharing. It's been a, it's been a fun, yeah. fun and scenic path. 
I love that. I love the variety. And uh, it, yeah, from going from an educator to marine biology to where you are today, that's pretty cool. And I think a lot of people can, uh, I don't know, you could, you could do a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think if anything, you know, it'll teach me to be patient with my kids as they try to sort out their their uh, <laughs> career decisions when that time comes. Definitely. <laughs> True. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, kind of switching gears a little bit, I wanted to know what the different ways the federal and statewide agencies have addressed environmental compliance um, during COVID and how have their approaches changed from the beginning of the pandemic to today? Yeah. Um, I'll start at the state level. I don't think that um, the state's uh, approach has changed in a in a radical way. I think what happened during COVID at the state level was certainly a greater emphasis placed on um, environmental health and safety issues, understandably worker safety, um, dealing with, you know, what do we do with this with this virus that's that's going around like crazy and you know places have to work we've got essential businesses that need to operate um, how do we make that happen in a safe way so really i think the focus shifted to that but the state uh, the entire time never said it was going to stop continuing um, to enforce environmental obligations uh, there was a time period and, and it may still be going where regulated entities had the opportunity to petition the California EPA board to extend compliance deadlines or um, seek other time limited rev remedies if they could establish hardship. Um, I never actually had a client that that went through that process so I don't know the specifics of, of how that worked um, or how likely it was to get the hardship granted. Um, mm -hmm. I think now as, as uh, we're starting to get the pandemic under control, people and businesses have started to kind of figure out how to operate even with the pandemic and starting to look forward. I think mm -hmm. the overall climate uh, of enforcement in the state starts to get back to what it looked like, you know, almost one year ago today. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's one caveat though. We're gonna have a new attorney general soon. Um, mm -hmm. And that attorney general will bring his or her own set of enforcement priorities to the position. How those priorities dovetail or diverge with the priorities of the Cal EPA will determine, um, I think, how uh, how aggressively the the things bubble up to the prosecutors that that are trying to enforce violations. I don't think there's much that's going to change at the agency level. But you know what gets referred to uh, a district attorney or another prosecutor, um, and now I mean the the last attorney general uh, spent a lot of time suing the last administration. I think we can see a lot less of that from the new <laughs> attorney general. So um, you know how how is the new AG going to keep him or herself busy um, moving Hi. forward? I think is a question that remains to be seen and depends on who gets appointed. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different story on the federal side. So okay. under the previous administration, for three years before the pandemic hit, environmental regulation enforcement was being significantly scaled back. Um, it essentially came to a stop during the pandemic um, with the priority being to stimulate business, get the economy going again, and um, including the US EPA issuing a, a temporary enforcement policy, which essentially said, you know, if you're struggling to meet your compliance uh, obligations, we understand, just try to keep a record of it, don't worry about it kind of thing. Yeah. That policy uh, expired at the end of last August. And of course, we got a new administration oh. in um, that has made environmental issues really a top priority. Um, and so I think we're gonna see things kind of ricochet back uh, in the other direction in a, in a pretty big way. Um, I don't think we're seeing the details of how that plays out just yet because the new leadership at the at the environmental agencies on the federal level is just now starting to get into place. Um, but, you know, everything we've been told is that they're going to focus on environmental justice. And, and the way I think of that is uh, regulations that are aimed at protecting certainly the most vulnerable communities. So if, if your industry um, somehow 
can be seen as, as impacting those communities, then um, I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of pretty stringent, um, whether it's rulemaking or or enforcement, that you're going to have to be ready for. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good to know. Um, that definitely makes sense as far as the difference between the state and federal side. It sounds like they're big. Um, but yeah. like Attorney General, any idea when that? I, I don't know when that will kind of go into place when we're supposed to get a new one. I I don't know the timing. Um, I mean, I think, you know, so uh, the the now outgoing attorney general, although he's still technically in the role, um, Javier Becerra, his nomination to be the head of U.S. Health and Human Services just advanced to the Senate floor, I think, this week. Um, they haven't voted on it. He'll get confirmed, I think, barring any unforeseen surprises. Um, but I think until that happens, I think he's still the attorney general. So um, I know there's, you know, been names that have been thrown around for his replacement, but I don't know how quickly that that replacement gets put into place after uh, he's confirmed at the federal level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, if there are, you know, start to be changes when his replacement does come into into play, and they take some time to get settled in, but then find that they need to start, you know, focusing on enforcement to keep themselves busy, like you said. How are some ways that people, especially like in our industrial facilities, or clients that we work with, like how can how can they stay informed? Yeah. Um, good question. So, I mean, I think I think on the ground compliance um, doesn't really. Uh, I think there's there's sort of a there's a disconnect between on, on the ground compliance, day to day operations, and what the AG and the Justice Department at the state level are working on. Um, what they're doing is they're taking referrals from agencies who have seen non-compliance in their oversight roles, um, and then they're deciding whether to uh, essentially go after the non-compliers um, based really on past violations. I mean, they're certainly interested in stopping ongoing and potentially future violations, but they're looking back at a record of non-compliance and deciding whether to bring an action. Um, so I don't know that we're going to uh, I don't know whether the um, on the ground day to day operations um, really change in terms of mm -hmm. who the AG is. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what's particularly important is um, now that you know we've had this crazy year where mm -hmm. so many things have changed and so many things about the way businesses operate have changed, mm -hmm. um, it's important to understand what your obligations are, whether you've got an organized policy around those, um, who knows who knows what those policies are and how to implement them. Um, are there backups in case surprises happen um, mm -hmm. as, as we had? And you know the the regulators that you're dealing with, whether it's monthly or um, every six months or every year that are looking at environmental uh, compliance obligations and, and issues. What do they care most about? And, um, you know, I, for the most part, I find that the on the ground inspectors and regulators mm -hmm. are pretty easy to talk to about what they're yeah. looking for and what they care about. Mm -hmm. um, I say that with, you know, with a bit of a grain of salt because I think they're always well intentioned and they always know what they care about, but um, they may say something to you and then their supervisor or their director has a different point of view and then you've got to adjust to that. But but it's important to have that relationship so that when um, when things when things are different than what you understand them to be, you have a line of communication to help clear up those differences sooner than later. With the um, inspector or mm -hmm. regulator. Right. Yeah, with your kind of day-to-day -day regulator. Gotcha. Okay. So it's better safe than sorry to just be in contact with them. Always. Next. Good, to know. Good, good <laughs> advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of going off that a little bit, 
Um, what do you think is the common compliance um, issues that industrial industrial facilities um, struggled with during the COVID pandemic? And then were there any like solutions that you recommended to maybe your clients or um, that you saw um, facilities implementing? Yeah, I mean, any obligation that required a person to to fulfill or to carry through that obligation created a huge challenge. So whether that's conducting some sort of routine inspection of um, compliance systems or equipment, um, if that's uh, waste storage labeling requirements that you know you, you've got to bring in, um, you, you've got to be there to, to get a new drum delivered and you've got to put a new label on it and you've got to write when it uh, when you got it in and when the first piece of waste went in there and what type of waste, you know, all of those human functions. Um, if you had reporting obligations that, again, were not just happening automatically, but required some sort of input from somebody, all of those created challenges for how to staff those functions with properly trained people. Um, mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden you're working with a much smaller workforce. Um, you know, I think even if you are an essential business, because even essential businesses had to make um, immediate accommodations for uh, workers who may otherwise have needed to be on site, but are experiencing symptoms or otherwise have a legitimate concern about protecting themselves from, from the spread of the virus. Uh, then when those functions that require personnel at the site also rely on coordination with a third party vendor that's another layer of complexity because those vendors are dealing with the exact same issues right. so um those to me those were the biggest challenges i saw is just every time i talked to a client they were working with um, a smaller crew and they were trying to figure out how to manage all these functions and sometimes people were doing things that they hadn't received formal training on mm -hmm. um, but because they're just trying to kind of keep things going and, and keep their obligations um, compliant and all of that. So um, I think, you know, as hard and challenging as that was, one of the things that I hope has come out of it um, is that you've now got people that were potentially trained to do things, you know, whether through experience or something else that, that maybe they hadn't before, and now you've got a certain level of redundancy mm -hmm. um, to meet your compliance obligations. Uh, Cal OSHA, the state uh, employee health and safety um, agency, was <laughs> was really busy last year between conducting inspections and investigations and in, in response to either worker complaints or, or other incidents of of infections or outbreaks, and also just you know issuing emergency regulations about what kind of paperwork and policies need to be in place or needed to be created. So mm -hmm. if you manage to weather that storm, and, it, and it's not over, it's still ongoing. I mean, I still have clients that are wrapped up in, um, in OSHA inspections and investigations. But mm -hmm. if you've largely managed to weather that storm, hopefully you've got an updated um, EHS policy or IIPP. Um, you're now required to have a COVID prevention plan um, all of these things, if they're put together uh, well, they provide clear protocols for dealing with EHS incidents and can be used, you know, going forward once we're on the other side of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, um, I think that's a, a great a lot, many points that you bring up. Um, one of them being that, um, you know, personnel now had to take on you know, more obligation, more tasks to get things done. And I think that is definitely a positive insight that's come out of this. A great point that you make, especially that a lot of, you know, the compliance obligations where you'd have one EHS person doing it or whatnot. Um, now that other people are doing it, it's actually maybe re helping them realize that we can work as a team and like it's actually possible and like accessible for us to, to do this is actually not too difficult. Um, so if anything, maybe COVID provided a push or <laughs> just like allowing companies to get a better idea of what their teams are capable of, uh, which is awesome moving forward, like you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, um, I actually did have another question kind of following from what you talked about previously, but with, I don't know if these have to do, but with the temporary enforcement policy that the EPA passed, you mentioned that it expired 
in August. Um, that's super interesting because you're, you know, noting that it's well, obviously went longer than COVID is still like happening. Right. So why why didn't they extend that? Being that you know, there's a lot of people that you know weren't able to be in person and just things in August for can obviously like still not <laughs> back to normal. Um, and it was going to be more long term. Any insight about that? Well, um, that is that's a good question. I mean, why why the previous administration didn't extend it beyond August? I don't know. Um, you know, given that the previous administration had a different uh, view or different prioritization of enforcement, I don't know that it's going to have a lot of practical effect. What what will be interesting to see is what legal effect it might have if if you're facing enforcement from on the federal level mm -hmm. um, for some violations of, of compliance obligations mm -hmm. that occurred during that temporary policy window, um, you know how uh, how successful is it going to be for you to kind of take the position that you're okay because you know some number of alleged violations occurred during that window. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more closely that you can show that you um, met the terms of that temporary policy, that you were making reasonable best efforts, that you were documenting, that you were in communication with regulators, you know, that that's certainly going to, um, that's going to make it easier to get uh, the penalties reduced or to to show that you were compliant, even though you know, you were maybe missing certain obligations because you were operating kind of in good faith within the bounds of the policy. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm certainly not surprised that the new administration didn't kind of take it up and extend it. Um, and I think if the last administration had sort of just kept it in place indefinitely, it would have been, it would have been ended by now anyway. Yeah, definitely. That makes, yeah, makes a lot of sense. It sounds like the key is just that record keeping and making sure that you have the documentation to prove that during that time you were doing something or like trying to act in good faith, as you said, um, right. kind of going yeah. off that. Oops, yeah, sorry. so I was just going to add, sorry, that um, I, you know, it's not lost on me that the added, um, the the added layer of keeping records of what you're not able to do is also a challenge because again, you need people that are <laughs> that are going to be doing that who's who are otherwise busy trying to deal with other issues. So <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't make life easy. Um, I guess it's supposed to be a bit of a um, a relief, but it, even that require you know it's it's making work that you didn't otherwise um, yeah. have the ability or the capacity to do. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Go ahead, Julie. Yes, just yeah, great, great point. I mean, with that, um, have you noticed any companies, you know, starting to use different technologies or because they're working remotely, um, an increase in that at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know that I'm, I know about a specific or an industry specific technology that, mm -hmm. you know, either, either came up in response to the challenges of the pandemic um, or that wasn't already starting to be in, in use before. I mean, certainly every technology that has enabled us to do more of our work remotely mm -hmm. has um, taken on a much more prominent role in, in, yeah. our, in our work lives. Um, so I think there's been an acceleration of whatever trends were already starting to be in place for using technology. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw this month that US EPA is, has announced that it's going to um, an all e-manifest system for their uh, for tracking waste disposal. I think in effect as of this summer, um, you know, again, that's not something especially for uh, for EPA that they can just flip a switch and do overnight. It takes them a long time to, to make things, to, to put things into action. So that was probably going to happen anyway, but um, I, I think it's fair to say the timeline got sped up over the last year. Yeah, definitely one of those, uh, something that good that came out, if anything, I would say. Yeah, less paper. <laughs> yeah, less paper. Yeah. 
more accessibility. <laughs> yeah. Easier to for remote work too. So that's one positive. Cool. Yeah. Well, we are coming close to our time and I wanted to just finish um, with your final thoughts. Um, what advice do you have for companies? Um, what is maybe your biggest takeaway from this year? Um, just to kind of wrap us up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my advice and it's always been my advice, but I think the biggest takeaway from, from what happened this year is that you really need to have written policies for how you are handling your environmental com compliance obligations. I mean, really any of your legal obligations, but since this is the area that I practice in, that's what I'm thinking about a lot. <laughs> if you don't have a written policy, maybe you started off as a small company and everybody kind of had their role and sort of knew what their function was and, and didn't really need a written policy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, hopefully you've grown and, and you've got more people. But if you don't have a policy, get one because if you haven't grown yet, hopefully you're going to grow and you're gonna need that. And by the time you realize you're gonna need one, um, it's probably too late. If you have a written policy, follow it. <laughs> um, and don't rely on just one person to know where everything is, to know where all the records and documentation of compliance are. Um, because if you do, you're really asking for trouble if that person is not available for some period of time or leaves, and um, especially if that's a person with deep institutional knowledge about your operations. Um, I've had clients dealing with that really at, at, at really uh, in opportune times this past year when um, you know they've had an inspection or, or, or OSHA comes calling and the person who has known about where all these things are and where their records of inspections and, and things are, wasn't there anymore and, and nobody knew where to find those things. Um, so that doesn't, that, you know, that, that puts you in a bad position. Um, and then of course, if you become aware of an issue, whether it's a non-compliance issue, a worker complaint, an EHS incident, anything, take it seriously from the beginning. Um, don't wait until the enforcer or the regulator comes comes around and inspect and you know starts asking questions and, and pulling documents and records. Uh, if you're concerned about what an internal investigation of the incident might reveal or what a regulator might learn when they come around, then uh, bring in bring in counsel, whether it's you know your in-house counsel if you've got one or if there's outside counsel that you trust, but do it on the early end so you can kind of get everybody going on the same page and protecting mm -hmm. your interests. Yeah, thank you. Great points. <laughs> Those are really wonderful. I think people are definitely appreciate them and uh, it's good to know moving forward for sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure to have you on and to hear your insight. I think I've learned a lot. Um, I know our listeners probably have as well. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure and I look forward to our next chat. Yes, we do too. Definitely, hope, you know, hope not under the same circumstances. Right. <laughs> Definitely All looking right. forward to finding you again. Um, really quickly, we do just want to um, ask everyone to next week, please join us. We are um, hosting, oops, sorry, hosting Jerry Bailey from Apex Logistics. He will be discussing EHS in the transportation industry with us. Yes. And then if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email us at info at um, and have a wonderful Tuesday.